I love when you say hello, darling. That's my oh, favorite thing. Oh, good, baby. <laughs> I'm just here to make you happy. That's right. I like that. All right. Repeat that again for my husband. No. <laughs> I love you. I know. I love they you. They don't know how much you love me. I adore you. Well, guys, just as our interview was ending, I told Dolly that I was getting married in less than three weeks. Dolly shared with me that she's going to be married 46 years this May. So, of course, I had to ask her for a little bit of wedding advice. And, well, she gave me an answer that was very Dolly. Well, you got to stay close. you got to be free. you got to share things. And you've got to not be in each other's face all the time. So don't think you have to be in each other's face all the time. You give it a little space and give it a little respect and respect the other person. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's good to talk and to you And make a lot of love. Oh, <laughs> did you get that one? Yep. Usually I'm doing your reports from right there at home in Nashville, but today I am in Vegas where we're going to be all day and all night. He also has a top secret show that will hopefully air on HBO. So are you going to be like another, is it going to be like another Chelsea Lately, like panel or, or, uh, or nope. just stand up? Nope. Look, look at this, she's good. <laughs> yeah. McLeod! She grants my tractors, uh, you know, it's about my dream girl. A wild girl, like yourself. Yes, sometimes. And, uh, and country, I don't know if you're, you're country. Yes. You're country. All right, so you crank my tractor, Stacey. You wrote the song about me. I wrote it about you. Stacy. you've talked to everybody tonight, gotten all the scoop for us. <laughs> I know, it was a lot of fun in Nashville tonight, that's for sure. And everybody thinks about the CMT Music Awards and they think about the nominations and maybe who's going to win the awards. But another really cool thing about this show is all the performances. I'm going to say, I've seen in numerous places where people are like, wanted. All I want <laughs> is for a boy to sing me that song. Uh, so, I'm going to put you I on this. guy. Well, I do too. And so, <laughs> will you sing me just a little bit of wanted? Want it. Ah. <clears throat> uh. <laughs> I want to wrap you up, want to kiss your lips, I want to make you feel wanted. Ladies, be jealous. I wrote another version of that, you know. Did you? It's called I Want to Make You Feel Awkward, and that's what just <laughs> happened. Winning. I win. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> we have seen several folks from Tennessee compete on the hit show, and these three Middle Tennessee singers behind me all made it, all of them, into the top 20. Tonight, more on our locals, including local judge Keith Urban, and what the judges have to say about this season. Call me a maniac, but let's give this a try. She's a maniac, maniac on the floor. And she's dancing like she's never danced, dancing like she's never danced, dancing like she's never danced before. Okay, so it may not be worthy of an encore, but for an entertainment reporter, I think it'll do. That was hot. You know, you're looking like Statue of Liberty with that microphone up there. I don't like the short jokes now. I'm not joking. I'm being serious. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I'm just kidding. Anyway, we've been friends a long time. I can joke with you. Hey there. Good morning, everyone from here in Las Vegas. It's good to see everybody. It was a packed red carpet for the Fox American Country Awards. You name them, they were here. And I had a chance to talk to everyone from up and coming artists to the presenters, Trace and Kristen, and also some of the big nominees. I appreciate what you do. Oh, well, thank you, Blake Shelton. You're a very, you made me cry. You're, in very, you're very important to the music Aww. industry. Don't cry. Don't cry. It's okay. Yes, you are. It's okay. It's okay. So look who I just happened to bump into moments ago. Thanks Keith Urban, how nice are you? Nice to see you. Good to see you. You just now were on stage um, with some very talented youth. Talk about what you were doing just moments ago. Yeah, I got to play with uh, a lot of the kids from the Grammy camp. Yeah, look who I found. I found like the oh, leading yeah. man of the ACAs here. Pull me out of the gutters of Vegas. <laughs> Anybody you're hoping to be sitting next to tonight? I don't know. <laughs> they won't sit me with who I want to sit next to. That never happened. You can whisper. Who do you want it to be? I want to sit next to you. Ah, see you guys. Yep. Peace. We're going on earth is done. But the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. Last Friday, Father, there was an appointment. And he showed up. Oh, how he cried. 
the day he left us. We gather around your grave to greet you. I wish I could see angels' faces when they hear your sweet voice say. I think if uh, George Jones could uh, say anything right now, this might be what he would say. Don't grieve for me, for now I'm free. Some of George Jones' very best friends and biggest fans sang in that coveted circle at a memorial fit for the king everyone knew him to be. He was more than a country singer, he was a country song. I know a man. Today we're left with the gift of his songs singer. on earth. I know a man. The once was a drunk. And we can only imagine how beautiful the heavens now sound. I will cling, cling to the old ragged cross. Through both musical tribute and spoken word, for almost three hours, the Grand Ole Opry was filled with tears and at times laughter. If I sing this song, Nancy, if you could just kind of use your imagination and maybe picture a little bit of George singing it to you. I know that's a huge imagination. Uh, <laughs> unshaven, long-haired, confused country hip-hop rock and roller trying to channel George Jones. Be it with a smile or holding back tears. Brother George taught us all how to sing with a broken heart. In their own way, everyone here was remembering the George they knew. The possum, no-show Jones, the voice, country's greatest treasure. When I heard him do this song, it, it literally gave me chills. Amazing grace. If there ever was a person who experienced that How amazing grace in a wonderful fashion, it was George. While it's doubtful That's anyone will ever fill George Jones' shoes, he certainly left footprints for like others to follow in for years to come. God made just one like him, but aren't we glad he did? How great thou art. How great thou art. As long as there's a Grand Ole Opry, or, and as long as people anywhere are singing country music, George Jones' spirit will live on. When death has come and taken our loved one. It's so sad. It's so lonesome. We've been together so long. He stopped loving her today. But as long as there's a country music, he will be remembered. We're going to miss you, Mr. Jones. We love you, George. Here in Music City, all eyes have been glued to Idol because of our local connection, country star Keith Urban. I'm just me, <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I, I think my wife would testify that, 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 you know, if I sit on the couch and watch the TV and comment on it, it's no different from sitting behind the desk. Urban has proven to be a popular addition to the judges' table. His new co-workers agree. And Keith and I wind up sitting next to each other a lot. And he's so smart. And I told him, I said earlier, in all the years I've watched Idol, I feel like Keith always speaks from a unique perspective that I haven't heard on this show ever in 12 seasons. He's a really good person. And I think he's got a good heart in the way that he deals with, with uh, the artists. And he himself has said he feels he's a little bit harder on the country artists because that's, you know, he loves the genre so much and that's his thing. But Urban may not cause any drama, but he often finds himself in the middle of it. When asked, Nikki and Mariah were pretty tight-lipped about their issues. I know there's just been drama on the set. <laughs> I say nothing. <laughs> Zip it, right? Zippy long stocking. You know, it's going to be some cat fights too, but uh, 
comes with the territory. They all can agree on one thing. Country singers are representing again this year. We love Nashville. We, Nashville has done us very proud and very well. Yeah. Country's always representing. I mean, from day one on this show, I mean, you know, uh, it's just, it's amazing. I mean, you know, it's amazing the kids that show up. And what I love the most is that every art form feels comfortable enough with this show and this format to come out. Keith aside, Nashville has three new reasons to be excited about the hit show. Cree Harrison, so Paul Jolly, I've got the TV on. and Janelle Arthur. Dark, that you just might. Three singers that currently live in Music City that have made it to the top 20 on season 12 of the hit show. My favorite girl, I won't say her name because I don't want to do that, but actually I have two. <laughs> One is blonde, one has black hair. Two country girls that are just, like, they just seem real. They don't seem like they're pretending to be country. And um, we're obsessing over them. Well, we do have a girl from Nashville who's really, really good. That's all you can say right now? Yeah. Yeah, but she's excellent. You don't want to spoil it? Nope. Does she have your vote? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she could have been from anywhere she had my vote. I think my energy was just going toward other things. Family, specifically, having a baby at 40, navigating a blended family. After taking a break from releasing new music, six-time Grammy Award-winning musician Amy Grant is back with 11 new and very personal songs. Some try so Two years ago, Amy lost her mother, a dark time that fueled her to create her new album, How Mercy Looks From Here. After that first wave of debilitating grief, I suddenly felt like somebody had strapped a rocket engine to my creativity. It was one of the last things Grant's mother said to her that guided Amy through the recording project. I was walking out the door and she said, hey, will you do me a favor? I had no idea what she was going to say and I said, sure, what? And she said, when you walk out on that stage, sing something that matters. Amy took her mother's words to heart, a labor of love to say the least. In the end, the songs that came together so naturally on this record all were really mattered, everyone. Throughout the album, you'll hear many familiar voices, a supporting cast, as husband Vince Gill likes to call it, who sings on the song, Better Not to Know. See her kind of buck up and go after all this stuff was, I was back in the background just going at a girl. You'll also hear voices like Carol King, James Taylor, and Cheryl Crow. A much anticipated project, Grant hopes will give listeners what she calls a redemptive side of life. What I have learned is to reframe hard times in a context of I'm learning something here. Bobby Braddock came to Nashville almost 50 years ago to be a piano player for Marty Robbins, not knowing he would become one of the most legendary songwriters in Music City. To date, he's written about 2,500 songs, of which about 1,600 are published, including one of the biggest songs in country music history. He stopped loving her. I had the concept, you know, a, a, a love that, that was so strong, you know, that that only, only death could terminate. With so many songs in his library, you would think it would be hard to remember writing each one, but Braddock did something unique early in his career. Always made sure at the end of the day, uh, no matter what kind of shape I'm in or how I feel, I write down the events of the day. Journals that hold many details about writing He Stopped Loving Her Today with his mentor, Curly Putman. We started out with some uh, dark humor, funeral jokes, and that sort of thing. We wrote it in a while and then set it, set it aside. I always rated the song, right from one to 10, and I rated this one a seven. I thought it was okay, I didn't think it was a great song. With no clue who they were writing it for, several months later they decided to revisit the song. They finished it that October day, or so they thought. Legendary producer Billy Sherrill and George Jones took the song, but passed, then for some reason came back to it over two years later. Billy said, we want to cut that song, but it needs an extra verse. And I'd like to have a verse uh, uh, which you have the wife or the girlfriend coming back to the funeral. Bobby and Curly actually wrote such a verse, but discarded it. They found it and gave it to the producer, who still wasn't happy. I remember going back and forth from uh, Sony Music Publishing, now it was then called Tree Publishing Company, to Billy Sherrill's office. And uh, finally, the, the last one we took, and he really liked. 
Braddock went to listen to the finished project a few weeks later, not expecting what he was about to hear. He stopped loving her today. You hear this orchestra, the violins, cellos, and the violas swelling this ascending thing. It sounds, it sounds like the guy's soul's ascending to heaven. I knew it was something very special. Did it go up to a 10 at that point? Well, it did. He Stopped Loving Her Today was released in the spring of 1980, and it soared to the top of the country charts. But there's one thing about the song Braddock says he'll never quite understand. Well, I've heard some people tell me that they heard it for years before realizing that somebody died in it, you know. I guess some people, you have to get a hammer and beat them on the head. He died, you know. <laughs> Thought I saw a man brought to life. Blake Shelton knew Cassidy Pope was a star from the second he heard her audition on The Voice. Where you used to lie. Now, less than a year later, Cassidy is proving she fits right in here in Music City. I feel like I'm being embraced, and that is all I could ask for. Several of the covers she did on the singing show went to number one on iTunes, which made her nervous when she released her first single, Wasting All These Tears. Try to find you at the bottom of a bottle. If it doesn't do that, then people are going to be let down, and, and that means that they're not into my original stuff like they were into the covers. The fans liked what they heard, downloading the song over 230,000 times, sending it to that number one iTunes position. I just thought it was a great uh, first impression because it's voicey, it's, it's vocally challenging, and it's also a really, really um, emotionally deep song. Um, there's a lot of relatability in it. Wasting All These Tears is the first single on her debut album, Frame by Frame, set to be released October 8th. It tells a story. It's all these moments captured in time, and um, you know, you're flipping through each of the, the lyric sheets, and you're hearing this story. It's an emotional roller coaster. It's not all about love, it's about life. Since the fans got Cassidy where she is today, she wanted to keep them involved, so she let them choose the album art. I want them to feel like they're, um, st they still have a huge part in, in why I'm here. The entire process has been a dream for the soon to be 24 year old singer from Florida, especially this part. Standing on a corner crying. Singing on the Grand Ole Opry stage. I grew up loving Patsy Cline and knowing that she stood on that circle was a big moment for me. A successful start for what appears to be a long music career. Stacy McLeod, Fox 17 News. She was like 19 years old, you know, this little girl with a dream. She came blown into Nashville and she had a karaoke tape. Before the world was introduced to Mindy McCready in the mid 90s, Jimmy Nichols was her studio dad, part of the team that prepped Mindy for her big break. It was an amazing thing watching this cocoon turn into a butterfly. Mindy signed to BNA, released her debut album and her career quickly took off. Kim Tribble wrote her number one hit, Guys Do It All the Time. Kim says he's honored to have a song that will help keep the lively young lady that he knew alive. What she had to go through at the end and, uh, you know, her for a career and everything and trying to re rebuild her career and everything, it's, it's been a, you know, it's a tragic country song <laughs> in itself. For roughly a decade, McCready had career ups and downs, a whirlwind that Nichols says was just too much for the young star to handle. I remember saying to Mindy, Mindy, don't let this business, sorry, don't let this business drag you down, because it will. Nichols says Mindy wanted to re-release her hits, it just never worked out. But she did get to sing one final song, written by Nashville songwriter Courtney Dash. And if tomorrow's gonna be the same. I was playing the song in a writer's night probably two or three years ago. Afterwards, she came up and I mean, she was she had tears just running down her face, and she said, "That song is my life. I need to record that song." Mindy recorded the song about hope and put it on the internet just days before her suicide. A haunting sound, not only for Dash but for Nichols, who Mindy called asking for help. She said, "But I have to have it out by Sunday." And I went, why? Why Sunday? Now Nichols believes he knows why. He thinks it was the only way she knew how to say goodbye. 
I think that song was maybe her message, her last message. So love her for the music and don't judge her for, for those demons that haunted her all her life. I love George. Oh, I know. <laughs> that was my buddy. I know you did, baby. And it, I think he's everybody's buddy. From 2 to 92, one thing most of the world has in common is a love for George Jones. Baby, my baby, why you make me cry, baby, cry, baby. But no one loved the possum more than his wife of 30 years, Nancy. George was a, the most loving man. Truthfully, he was. Nancy and George married in March of 1983. On more than one occasion, he's credited her with saving his life. If I didn't have much of a life uh, up to about 15 years ago, and I found out it, was, it could be a wonderful thing. Nancy says he did a lot for her, too. He taught her the ins and outs of the music business, but more than anything, taught her how to love. His favorite line was, no, God wouldn't want you to be mad at him. And he told me if you was mad at someone, you don't hold a grudge. You kill them with kindness. You don't mean you have to run around with them, but you always be nice to them. And sure enough, it works. It makes you feel good. You don't have all of that bitterness inside. It's hard for Nancy to hold back tears. We've been together so long. It's hard. So she clings to some of his final words. And I was crying, and he said, what are you crying for? I've had 81 good years. Some of them I messed up, paid for them. Now I'm going to heaven. I've had 81 good years. So don't cry, honey. While the world may have lost a legend, Nancy lost her best friend. But it's so sad. It's so lonesome. But George thought about that, too, and left a very special young man in charge, his 13-year-old adopted grandson, Carlos. So when he came to the hospital to see George, he said, now you're going to be the man of the house. And he said, I can do it, Papa. I can do it. So sure enough, the first night I got up and I was going to go get something to drink, and he said, I'll get it, Momo. I'm the man of the house now. Nancy says all she can do now is carry out all his final wishes and make sure his legacy lives on. He talked all the way up until probably six hours before he died. I'm carrying everything he told me to do.